Ethiopia is one of the oldest countries in Africa. During the early 4th century Common Era, Christianity was declared its state religion under the reign of Izana, and during this reign is when the Aksumites, named after the city Aksum, declared themselves the Ethiopians. Ethiopia has undergone various hardships from outsiders and domestic turmoil over the millennia. It was in the 19th century where its modern history and culture would begin to emerge under a unified country. It was through King Menelik II that Ethiopia was transformed into the well-organized and advanced country that it is today. Ethiopia defeated an Egyptian invasion in 1876 and an Italian invasion in 1896 that ended with 17,000 of its people dead. It was through this victory that Ethiopia became recognized as a legitimate state by European powers. King Menelik was a tough and intelligent ruler with love for his country. In the past, many African rulers relied on spirituality to help them through warfare, but Menelik understood the times and his enemy. When the European enemies came, he used a heavy assortment of guns to fight them off, defeating them and clearing the way for a prosperous Ethiopia. It was his cousin's son, Haile Selassie I, who would later in 1930 become crowned and create an everlasting impression on the world and Africans. His political, structural, and academic achievements for Ethiopia were unprecedented. However, it was his influence on the Rastafarian movement that would establish him as a divine icon. The most enigmatic report about him and his lineage is that he and the rulers before him have a direct lineage to King Solomon, the wisest and richest king of the Bible. According to the Bible, in 1 Kings chapter 10, an Ethiopian, Queen Sheba, went on a royal trip to visit King Solomon after hearing of his immense wisdom. The Bible doesn't go into much detail about their visit other than them having spent the night together. An Ethiopian tale contained in the Kebra Nagast, The Glory of Kings, an antiquated text at least 700 years old, holds a more detailed version of the story. The text is a sort of romantic tale of how Solomon swoons Queen Makeda, or the Queen of Sheba, and impregnates her. Among their time together, he educates her on spiritual matters. He leaves her with a ring in which his future son could use as a talisman to identify himself to Solomon. Makeda leaves back to Ethiopia and years later her son Menelik I travels to Jerusalem to confide with his father. After Solomon attempts to have his son stay and succeed him as a ruler, it's decided that Menelik will travel back to Ethiopia accompanied by young men of the kingdom to support the kingdom in Ethiopia as a country of God. During this process, some of the men akin to the priesthood took the famed Ark of the Covenant without both Solomon and Menelik's knowledge. This powerful piece of divine technology has stumped not only biblical scholars, but alternative researchers as well. It was this Menelik that the lineage of the later Ethiopian kings, such as Haile Selassie I, would descend from. The Ark of the Covenant is a strange relic. It is a golden chest containing the original Torah as written by Moses, the commandments, and other sacred artifacts. It was carefully designed according to Yahweh's specific instructions to the priesthood among Moses. Having to be carried by four priests, the Ark had some intriguing metaphysical powers as well. In the Bible, it was used to split a river in half so that they could cross through. It could destroy buildings and needed to be covered by cloth because it had some sort of radiance that could not only instantly blind someone but also zap them with some sort of power and kill them. The Ark has been rumored to be kept hidden in various places throughout history, some of them in Europe and Egypt. What makes Ethiopia's claims even more interesting and viable is a very ancient tradition surrounding the Ark of the Covenant. 
Ethiopia is home to one of the oldest forms of Christianity as is represented by its ancient stone church in Lalibela dating back to the 12th century common era. Ethiopia is one of the few old world countries in that area that was able to remain isolated and free of Islam invasion. However, what is even more fascinating is its roots of Judaism. There has been a community of Ethiopians living there for thousands of years who claim to be Jews of the House of Israel. Living in a remote mountainous region of northwestern Ethiopia, an area which until recently could be reached only on foot or on horseback, are African Jews who call themselves Kela or Beta Israel, the House of Israel. They observe the Sabbath as indicated in the Torah, eat only kosher food, pray in straw-roofed synagogues, and use only unleavened bread during the seven days of Passover. Yet, they also offer animals in sacrifice and have priests and deacons appointed by the community. Their neighbors call them falashas, which means strangers, wanderers, or exiles. Today, the chief rabbis of both the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic Jews recognize these indigenous Ethiopians, members of the Agua ethnic group, as authentic Jews. 19th century Christian missionaries found that this group celebrated Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Passover. They also slaughtered a lamb at Passover and knew only the first five books of the Bible and some apocryphal books excluded from Hebrew scripture. Because of some of their practices, which are a form of ancient Judaism, and their exclusion of many modern holidays and practices, the presence of the Ethiopian Jews must be thousands of years old, predating the modern orthodoxy. In the Bible, Zephaniah 3.10 says, From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my supplicants, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. If this prophecy truly dates from around 630 BCE, as most scholars believe, then it would indicate that Zephaniah was aware of a presence of a Jewish community in East Africa long before the fall of the First Temple. Regardless of the strange tales and uncertainty of the origins for the Ethiopian Jewish presence, what stands is their communal remains and architecture. Researcher and author Graham Hancock has taken this unanswered question head-on in his documentary Search for the Ark of the Covenant, based on his book The Sign and the Seal. One of the most important festivals on the Ethiopian calendar, Timkat, consists of three days of various religious celebrations. During the festival, models of the Ark of the Covenant, called tabits, are taken from churches and wrapped in cloth and silk. The most senior priest from each church leads the procession to the river or bath, carrying the tabits on their heads. Hancock traveled throughout Ethiopia, speaking with the locals and the religious authorities, being shown all sorts of hidden and sacred monasteries, such as Debradamo. This sacred temple is hidden away in highlands and is only accessible by a 15-meter rope climb. the home of several ancient biblical manuscripts until it was bombed and looted in 2021 during a civil war. Hancock's mission in the mid-90s revealed that it was not the hiding place of the Ark, but another possible site was Lake Tana, the source of the Blue Nile. Among the secretive and isolated landscapes are monks safeguarding more relics and wisdom. Hancock was told by the abbot of that monastery that the Ark was kept there for 800 years, then it was taken to Aksum, Ethiopia. On Lake Tana, Hancock was shown very old sacrificial stones that have been recognized as being of genuine ancient Jewish style. There is no other place in the world that claims to have possession of the Ark, have ancient Jewish customs, and have holidays that surround the celebration of the Ark through mock representations. There is a tiny chapel in the center of Aksum in the compound of the ancient church dedicated to St. Mary of Zion. Ethiopians believe inside of this sanctuary rests the true Ark of the Covenant. 
but only one man has the privilege and responsibility of tending the sacred relic that is hidden away within the gated and guarded chapel. This abbot, during Hancock's stay, explained that the object is holy and can only be handled by someone called by God to do so. It cannot be touched or looked upon. Doing so can kill an unprepared person. He says in the 1994 documentary, if your desire is to see the Ark, you simply cannot. It is forbidden. Hancock's theory on how the Ark made its way to Ethiopia starts with the last time the Ark had been seen. According to the Bible, its last known resting place was where the Dome of the Rock is currently situated, where Solomon's Temple once stood. During the historical King Manasseh's reign over Jerusalem, there was massive upheaval. He murdered many Jews and disgraced the temple by placing a pagan idol there. From this period of chaos, the priest took the ark and carried it away from the madness and bloodshed that overtook Jerusalem. Having to search for clues outside of the Bible, Hancock found that on a small island in Egypt on the Upper Nile, Elephantine, there sits a mysterious Jewish temple. Elephantine is in the middle of the ancient trade route that once connected Ethiopia to Palestine. The temple was erected in the 7th century BCE, exactly the time King Manasseh reigned in Jerusalem. Hancock speculates that this temporary temple was erected to house the Ark. This was the only temple in the world outside of Jerusalem at that time. 200 years after the temple had been built, the local Egyptians destroyed the temple after some bitter conflicts. Escaping the possibility of another chaotic environment, they looked for a new route. They couldn't head north that would put them right into conflict with Egypt. East and west were harsh desert, so they could only head one way, south. They followed the Nile towards Ethiopia, where they would eventually end up at Lake Tana. These legends and claims have given Ethiopians a rich cultural spirit that would continue through its imperial kings. Among its kings, none other would be more impactful on the world stage than Haile Selassie I. He was born out of royal blood in the countryside. His father was Ras Makonnen, grandson of Salih Selassie, king and ruler of Shiwa a historical kingdom within ancient Ethiopia. After King Menelik II's death, with no sons and Ras Makonnen, his cousin gone as well, his grandson, Lij Iyasu, was crowned by default. He was a troubled person who had mental health issues and even tried to murder the young Haile Selassie, then known as Tafari. Iyasu paid a servant to poke holes in Tafari's fishing boat. When Tafari and his friend realized the boat was sinking, they swam to shore, with only Tafari making it back alive. Among Liz Yasu's outlandish escapades, he converted to Islam, turning his back on the Christian empire he had inherited. He was formally excommunicated by the church, promoting Tafari as regent or Ras Tafari at the age of 24 years old. Lijiasu's father, Ras Michael, gathered an army to attempt to restore his son to the throne. Ras Tafari, with his army, fought this militia of rebels out on the plains of the country. This battle is remembered through decorative art in Ethiopia and is remembered as Tafari's first major victory and accomplishment. He was eventually crowned as Emperor Haile Selassie I at the age of 38. His next intense showdown was with Italian fascist Mussolini. Haile Selassie pleaded to the League of Nations for assistance. However, he was betrayed and Ethiopia was partially handed over to Italy. It was a dangerous and uncertain time for Ethiopia. Its thousands of years as a nation was being threatened to complete destruction. Selassie would often retreat to the stone Christian monasteries of Lalibela to pray for his country. When Mussolini joined Hitler in 1945, Britain decided to support Selassie and help him take back his country. After the fall of the fascists and Nazis, Haile Selassie put immense effort into building Ethiopia into a modern infrastructure with impressive government and education. He became a strong political leader, father figure of the country, and divine personage to the faithful Rastafarians. 
He became emperor of Ethiopia on November 2nd, 1930, and ruled for nearly 45 years. He endured many battles within his own family, country, and with war and betrayal from outside powers. In his old age, he would be faced with his final betrayal. Ethiopia, being an imperial monarch, gave Selassie ultimate rule. As the 60s prospered, students of Ethiopia studying abroad began to be influenced by communist ideals and sought to destroy and reform the monarch. These young academic rebels were putting pressure on the aging Selassie. Among this issue, there were ethnic wars beginning to brew on the borders as well. A new age was dawning in the world. The emperor had disappeared in August 1975. A year before, he had been arrested by a mutiny led by Mengistu. He and his militia, the Derd, led the country for 17 years. When Mengistu's regime collapsed, the new democratic government allowed for a search for the remains of Haile Selassie. Some bones were found and shown on TV, but Rastafarians did not believe these to be the remains of their redeemer. To this day, most Rastafarians believe Haile Selassie is still alive and like some of the prophets of the Bible, was taken by God to heaven and away from the crumbling world. Rastafarians donned their name as Christians did so after the name of their spiritual leader, Rastafari. Ethiopia, being a deeply Christian nation, gave rise to a new form of Christianity known as Rastafarianism. This new form of Christianity consisted of the belief in the Bible, black people's role in it, the Solomonic dynasty of Ethiopia's rulers, that Haile Selassie was Christ reincarnated, and that Babylon, or the New World Order, was a political force that Christians and Rastafarians would have to face. See, Christ promised that he will return within 2,000 years, you know, mm -hmm. and he said, when he come, he will be the king of kings, the lord of lords, the conquering line of Judah, through the lineage of King Solomon and King David. So I really search to find out if God is here. And I search, I look, I look in Ethiopia, I look all about, look in Germany, you know, because we're not prejudiced. We look for God. We look in Ethiopia, I see one man stand up with his name, Emperor Elias Lassie, name, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, conquering line of Judah through the lineage of King Solomon and King David, written in the Bible. <laughs>